incredible crowd. Thank you very much. And I'm sure there will be a lot of people filtering in as parking is a little bit of a challenge here at Sequoia. Um, welcome and welcome to the people who are also live streaming this with the record searchlight. So those of you who are uh, out there in Wi-Fi land, yeah, a, a, a favor we could ask is if you not connect to your Wi-Fi on your phone here in the uh, auditorium because we're limited on our access and we want the people that are live streaming to be able to see this. So
So we figured this is a good time to look outside to learn <laughs> from other, what other communities are doing that could inform these efforts here at Reading. Therefore, this forum is titled From One Community to Another, what San Antonio is learning from new approaches to mental health. <laughs> the Women's Fund of the Shasta Regional Community Foundation is lucky to have teamed Searchlight, uh, which as we speak is doing a three part series. I can show the, the headline here a three part series of in depth coverage on this very topic. Um, so, Elena Shulman, are you in here somewhere? Here we go. Elena has been a lead reporter for this series, and she was a recipient of the California Health Journalism uh, Fellowship from USC Annenberg. Um, so, thank you for your work on this to you and uh, for the care that you've given to this topic. Silas Lyons, the editor of the Record Searchlight, to share a few words about why they became involved in this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you all so much for being here. And I want to take just a moment um, to publicly thank and acknowledge Rachel, uh, who has been just a model for what collaborative leadership looks like as she pulled all of this together with us, with Leon Evans, and with the Women's Fund, and all of her partners there have worked so hard, I know. Uh, but it just has been incredible to watch, so thank you for your leadership. So welcome to all of you who've taken time out of your day uh, for this very important conversation. Whether you're able to be here with us in the audience, or you're following along on Reading.com, um, we've known for a long time uh, at the Record Searchlight that as the community's newspaper, we needed to take on the topic of mental health. And that came together this year when Layden was selected for that fellowship and began work on a series called Fragments of Care. Well, when we learned that the Women's Fund was planning a forum on the same topic, we practically begged them to let us come on as a co-sponsor, a full partner. Um, and I think uh, when we sat down at coffee that first time in the spring and talked about this, it was immediately uh, one of those wow moments that we, this is something we really have to do. We have to combine our resources and make this as, as uh, big as we can make it and as, have as much impact as possible. And so it's really, uh, it's really wonderful to find uh, as a partner to have been able to learn from them through this process. You know, what I couldn't have predicted was that the timing would be so perfect. Uh, we're going to talk about mental health today, but we're not talking about it in a vacuum. We're also going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about working together. And we've just seen the first draft of a joint city-county blueprint for public safety. We'll soon see the results of Councilwoman Kristen Schrader's study on homelessness, um, even as others in the community are pushing forward plans for a day center, new housing options, and other creative approaches. Elena's series on mental health uh, has already documented the sobering fact that our rural areas have the worst provider shortages in California. Uh, in the upcoming chapters in October and November, we'll be exploring mental health links to public safety and to homelessness. So I can't imagine a better time to welcome someone from a community that has grappled with many of the same issues. And I'm very interested in what Mr. Evans has to say today about those key topics of leadership and working together. The Record Searchlight is proud to co-present this critical conversation and I thank you all for participating. Thank you so much for being here. So after we hear from our guest speaker, we'll have about 30 minutes from 1 to 1.30 for kind of a facilitated conversation of sorts. Um, so just to give you a heads up, you probably passed index cards and pens um, on the way in here, and there are more that others can come by uh, and give to you when it's time. Um, but here's what we really want you to be especially listening for. Ooh, this clicker is tippy. Uh, so this is the question. Knowing that every community is different, what about the San Antonio model might be able to be applied here? And as you're listening, so feel free to write things down on those index cards. Try to be legible, you know, so that we can uh, track them later on. Um, and for those who are on the live stream and are following along, we want to have you use the hashtag MHLessons, and we are even going to transcribe your tweets onto index cards. We get those into the conversation as well. Um, so I'd like to uh, now introduce our guest speaker to you and you to him. 
This is Leon Evans. He's the president and CEO of the Center for Healthcare Services in San Antonio, Texas, where he leads the Restoration Center and much more. CNN recently named him as a mental wellness warrior, and the model that this team has pioneered in San Antonio is being emulated with great success in communities across the country. If you take a look at the back of your program, you can see his full bio and just start to get a sense of what he's up to around the U.S., around the world. Uh, so if you look at that, you'll get a sense he's quite a busy guy. In fact, we're going to ferry him away to the airport uh, just as soon as he's done talking. Uh, so we want to give you a quick snapshot of the room so that you can jump right in. Um, I'm going to ask, maybe Lenny, can we turn the lights on for just a, min a minute? Um, and I want to ask a few groups of people to stand just so we can get a snapshot of the room. Um, so if you, in the audience, if you encounter mental health because you work in a hospital or a healthcare or a healthcare worker, could you stand up? Stay standing, don't applaud, we're going to hold the poll. Just look around, take a look. Okay, stay standing. If you encounter mental health because you're in law enforcement and are on the front lines there in many ways, please stand up. If you touch this issue through some other part of the justice system, please stand up. If you come to mental health from an educator's point of view, please stand up. If you are a mental health services provider of any kind, and that's a broad set of categories, please stand up. If you or someone you know has ever struggled with mental health issues, please stand up. Thank you so much for being here and for bringing your perspectives into the room. So now, Mr. Evans, you have a snapshot of who's in the room. I'd like to hand the mic over to you. And don't worry about timing. I'll come sort of perch on your shoulder when it's about time to take whiskey away to the airport. Please join me in welcoming Leon Evans. Medicaid costs. That's the elderly end of life. 
and these people with severe mental illness who we end up getting on SSI and, and Social Security. So, uh, the chronic and persistent homeless, do you have some homeless folks here? Well, I almost guarantee that almost all of them have mental illnesses and or alcohol and drug problems. And their illness has been so painful for family and friend, friends, they're estranged. So they have nobody to advocate for them. And your community is probably like, our community. you know about your community? Wow. I've driven around, read it, I've seen your bridge, I've talked to a lot of your citizens. This is the best kept secret in the United States, and I'm all over the United States. <laughs> Anyway, if you Google the cost of homelessness to the taxpayers, you get all kinds of studies. I did it recently. The cheapest study I saw was about $30,000 a year to taxpayers. The homeless have lots of contact with law enforcement. They're in and out of jail. They're in and out of emergency rooms. Uh, so uh, it's very costly. You know, uh, with 30% of the people in jail out there with have had mental illness and behavioral health problems, you know, what does that cost? And I'll, I'll get into some history in Bear County and San Antonio. Uh, who's abusing and neglecting their children? Is child protective services a problem here? Well, most of those parents are abusing and neglecting their children or abusing and neglected children themselves for their trauma You know, they're self-medicating with alcohol and, and, and drugs. So we yank their child out of their home and give them no trauma-informed care. So they age out of foster care and they go to the streets and they start acting like their parents did. And so you have this vicious cycle that we never end up remaining with. What does that cost us? Uh, the National Institute of Health, the World Health Organization, and most recently, the Gates and the Gates Foundation was funded again at the University of Washington that looks at what they call disease burden. So, which diseases actually cost society the most money in lost productivity and actual health care costs? Four of the top ten in all of those are behavioral health. Okay? In fact, uh, uh, the, the CMS, the Federal Medicaid and Medicare Administration, has just started punishing hospitals and managed care organizations that have high readmission rates on an inpatient setting. So they want to pay for outcomes. They don't want to pay for process. So you know, insurance used to pay, which they pay for you to see your doctor, you know, your uh, x-rays, your lab work. And so they want to get smarter about how they pay. They actually want to you know, start paying health providers to have better health outcomes and reduce, you know, those hospital stays and stuff. So one of the ways they've done that is they started looking at high readmission rates for hospitals. And if you've had that high readmission rate, you actually lost 2% of your Medicare funding this year. So you may have some hospitals uh, close that do that, especially at public hospitals. So uh, CMS just released their uh, uh, report on the top 10 diagnoses for readmission. Number two, with some major mental illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depression. Number three with other mental illnesses, post-traumatic stress, phobias, anxiety disorders, personality disorders. Number seven was alcoholism, and number nine was drug abuse. So, you know, the point I want to make is this is very costly to society to address, and you know, we don't address it. And we have people who have lost lives, we're criminalizing people that have illnesses, we're driving up the cost of, of health care, and uh, you know, you know, there's so many social problems. But and I talked about mental health being a silent disease. But just think about it, there's no health without mental health. But what, I mean, I'm getting older. You know, I really dread you know, that I might sometime have Alzheimer's or dementia, you know, and lose my mental capacity. You know, that's scary, right? You know, we all have friends. That is a existence. So if you don't have your rationality or your, your mental health. So people with mental illness, this, you know, you know, the onset of mental illness happens in your teenage years or when you go off to college as a rule. So, uh, and it's treatable. Um, we're not in San Antonio. Let me give you some outcomes uh, in Bear County and San Antonio. The homeless count downtown San Antonio is down 85% over the last five years. Uh, in 2002, the Bear County Jail, the detention center, was being cited by the Texas Jail Standards Commission for overcrowding and deplorable conditions. Uh, our county uh, commissioners court decided to buy 
uh, jail space from other counties so they you wouldn't get sanctioned. There's also a federal judge started to look into it. They brought in an expert that said you need to build another thousand beds on the county jail right away. Uh, well, we started training law enforcement officers and had an alternative to jail and emergency room and put people back on the street. You'll see a film here a little bit called Restoration Center on the, uh, the rock wall video. And uh, so uh, we never built that additional thousand beds. We grew by 500,000 people last census. And I was with our sheriff because our U.S. Senator Cornyn, who's a whip in the U.S. Senate, has just uh, pinned a bill that, that wants to fund the Bear County Mall, the kinds of things that we're talking about today. And so our sheriff, she's, she is a retired two-star general. She is absolutely incredible. Uh, she had a brother that died uh, with mental illness, uh, you know, had a bipolar disorder, and her husband uh, had a schizoaffective disorder. So uh, she told me on that particular day, this was a couple of weeks ago, when the, when the center was at the restoration center to announce this bill, that there were 900 empty beds in the county jail at the time. So what would it cost our community to find that extra thousand beds? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the same years are tremendous. So we also have the health information exchange, so you all in healthcare out there understand that the federal government's put money into you know, uh, the health records because they want to have electronic health records. Not like the military, if you go any place, you can pull up your history and your lab work. And so they, they want to develop that kind of thing to drive the cost down and have better uh, healthcare costs. I mean, a better healthcare outcomes. So in San Antonio, we have what's possible. So all the hospitals are tied together. And these people who go untreated with severe mental illness, they, you know, EMS, you know, get you know, calls you know, all the time from EMS. So we had one lady uh, a couple years ago who had called EMS 600 times in three years. And she wanted somebody to visit her. You know, EMS didn't know about us. And, but when they found out about us, you know, they got us involved. We got the lady in the treatment. She hasn't called since. What kind of savings that, you know, was that? Uh, uh, anyway, this, this, this health information exchange, the hospital, we know that there are a lot of people who are uninsured going to emergency rooms and hospitals who are untreated. And they're showing up there because, you know, they don't know how to access mental health services or the public uh, mental health system, or they don't even know they have mental illnesses. And uh, so uh, what we did is we queried that uh, management information system and asked for persons that had mental, di mental health diagnoses that ended up in emergency rooms three or four times in a quarter. We got 200 some people, I think about 250 people popped out of that query. We developed a specialized intensive case management wraparound program. The reduction of people going in a public emergency is down 50%. You know, these, these people are thriving. So my, my point is, is treatment works. And I, I want to give you an example. I can actually prove to you the treatment works. Uh, not my data, but the Texas Department of Criminal Justice so uh, many years ago, the Texas uh, prison system uh, was almost a profit center for the state of Texas. We made prisoners work, we raised our own food, uh, you know, uh, we uh, made our own clothes, uh, we required, repaired school buses, made furniture, made the license tags. Uh, there were practically no staff. They had the building tender model, so they took the biggest, meanest, excuse my language, SOB, every single cell block put them in charge, and it was their job to keep the peace, and if they reported some subordinate, and if they did a good job, they got good time or special consideration. The problem with that, the way they kept the peace, was through violence and intimidation, so there's a lot of wrongful deaths. They also didn't have any medical services. So if you're dying of cancer, you just died this horrible disease. I mean, it's horrible death with your disease. So there's a federal class action lawsuit. Uh, the judge is weighing my justice. The, you know, the, the resolution settlement said Texas had to build a whole bunch of new 1,200 good prisons, actually staff them with professionals and have medical services. So Texas spent billions of dollars building all this. They built extra capacity because we're a lot of bond holder state. But the problem was the bill came home to the Texas legislature, and all that extra capacity was being filled up real fast. And the legislature got very concerned because they had this federal judge looking over their shoulder, and they agreed to do this, that they're going to have to build more of it. 
So they turned to their researcher, a guy named Dr. Tony Fabello, who now works with the Council of Governments and other, other states, and I like to work with California. And the researcher, and they said, Tony, tell us why our capacity is being used up. So Tony and his staff went and looked at the prison population in depth. And what he found was that there were a bunch of people in prison that shouldn't be there. So he published a report, which our governor probably fired him for, because he basically told the legislature, you're all pretty stupid. <laughs> and, uh, but the legislature heeded his advice, and they developed a, a new division called the Texas Commission on Offenders with Medical and Mental Impairments. And what Tony said was, nonviolent and mentally ill offenders that go to prison don't make good prisoners. They're hearing voices. It's hard for them to obey the rules, so they're always in lock, lockdown. They're agitating the other prisoners, so they're making it dangerous for everybody else. They get no good time, so they, tear up, they spend their entire uh, sentence you know, in the prison system. And if they go to the medical unit, it costs four to five times more than general population. And you multiply whatever it costs by day, uh, uh, by day wherever they are, times 365 times the length of service, and we're sometimes talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. So what they did when they brought this new commission, they went and found these people, they put them on the road, and they found me, not the mental health system in Texas, but the criminal justice system. The condition of the parole of these nonviolent mental health offenders is they've got to see my doctor, they've got to do, take their medication, they have to do their alcohol drug screen, and generally stay in compliance with their treatment. Okay? So, uh, felons on parole, four, you know, law enforcement officers and judges in the audience can tell you this is true. Four to uh, six years on parole, the revocation rates are 40 to 60 percent. In other words, they re and go back to jail or prison. If you have a mental illness that goes untreated, it's a little bit higher. Guess what it is in Bear County when they treat these people? This is not my number. This comes out of the criminal justice you know, division. They keep the data. It's 6.6%. .6%. Yeah, yeah. And uh, most of those people are technical revocations. We round them up, get them back in front of the doctor, in front of adult probation. So many of them don't go back to jail or prison. So treatment works if you can get a person to treatment. So we, we uh, support strongly the veterans' courts, the mental health courts, the drug courts, and the children's courts, because the children's courts are not about the kids. It's about their family members who are abusing alcohol, drugs, or mental illnesses, getting their act together and getting treatment so they get their kids back. We also have an intensive outpatient commitment on the civil side that uh, we support the therapy again, which is in. Because a lot of these people are sick, they don't know they're sick in their treatment resistance. I know you probably have homeless people on the street, and you reach out and try to help them, they don't want the help, right? You know, uh, they, they, they don't like where, where they are. So San Diego, we don't do this in, in San Antonio, but we looked at the San Diego model. And they actually had a strip center in San Diego to research on their, on their high utilizers. I think there was, you know, 300 some people, and it cost the county $16 million. A lot of that cost, not whether in jail or emergency rooms, people actually got bedded into the hospital that had these terrible diseases associated with their alcohol and drug use. You know, congestive heart failure, liver disease, and of course they smoke. And uh, so what they did is they offer people treatment when they get arrested. Then if they decline, then the next time they go in, they have graduated sessions. You stay in jail. And if you don't go to treatment, the next time you stay long. So absolutely, that model kind of works. Sooner or later, people say, oh, I get it, I'll go to treatment. And uh, that, that program affects really works. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in courtrooms on a civil commitment where uh, Polly Jackson Spencer, this lady, the civil judge we have, uh, in Texas to be eligible for the civil commitment, had to spend at least 60 consecutive days in the state hospital. And so uh, we queried, and I think about 50 people that popped out. And uh, so I was in her courtroom, and she would say things like, she had a black robes on. She would say, Leon, you've been in and out of my court many times over the years. Your mental illness has been so painful for family and friends. You're estranged. You spent most of your life in the institution. And I'm going to help you get your life back. So I'm going to ask this lady, Mary Helen Lopez, who works with me and works for the Center for Healthcare Service, to develop you a special plan, and I expect you to comply. So the first year we did that, we took the baseline on everybody. We had a 67% reduction in readmission rates with this very low population. Because you got this caring judge in a row, a black row effect really works, uh, saying, you know, you're special, but I expect you to do it. 
And so I actually paid for that person, Mary Ellen Lopez, that worked for the judge. And because I asked her why she didn't use the intensity outpatient commitment, she said, well, I'm a judge, what would I commit them to? And then how would I know if they were compliant? And I said, well, what if I pay for a caseworker who can work with our staff to develop their good treatment plan, then we can get back with them. So she felt bad because we don't have any money at that time that I was paying for this person. And she went to the commissioners and asked them to pay. And one of the county commissioners, Tommy Atkinson, said, well, Polly, does this really work? And she said, well, yeah, I mean, I had a lady in my call room this morning where I was uh, uh, renewing her commitment order. And she said, Judge, you know I don't have a mental illness, but when you order me to see the doctor take my medication, she said, the voices are nicer to me. So, <laughs> yeah. so she's begging the judge, you know, keep, keep helping me because I'm getting my life back and I'm not in the institution. So uh, I could kind of go on and on. But do you see the problem? You know, the waste of life, the, the waste of tax dollars. Uh, Texas is very conservative, right? We have been probably the most conservative think tank that's very well funded. And they have done a lot of research and they've used a lot of our data and they have this, this uh, initiative called Right on Crime. Okay? Right means conservative. And so they've taken their data all over the United States and probably the conservative think tank here in California and they've talked to people like the Koch brothers and everybody else. And so some of the most conservative people in the United States have figured out that you know, by uh, providing these services and paying for them, you actually improve the public safety net and you save the taxpayers a lot of dollars. So it doesn't matter whether you're a conservative community or a liberal community, this is really a nonpartisan issue. And, uh, you know, it's the golden rule. I mean, you know, uh, this, you know we, if we had an illness or we had a family member or a friend, we would want to uh, uh, be treated in the right way. So uh, we, we have all these great outcomes. Uh, people come from all of the United States and all over the world. We've had seven countries come and visit. And they always are impressed with our programs. But what they really say is, how'd you get everybody to work together? So we've got hospitals, we've got law enforcement officers, we've got judges, we've got NAMI, consumer and family members. We have EMS, and we meet on a uh, regular basis. In fact, today we had our medical director's roundtable that's chaired by our emergency room physician. And we have 40 to 60 people show up monthly and get all this data on what's working and not working. I mean, a ton of data. And I want to share that with Rachel and, and your group and just kind of show you. But we have this continuous quality improvement. And we just opened it up to the, the entire community so they can see what's working and not working. So, uh, you know, like in any relationship, the more you give, the more you get. We have this very open process. So we have a lot of our partners who could be sitting in my place right now. You know, law enforcement officers, judges, and a lot of other people are giving the same speech because they, they're they really committed to this process. They've seen all the good that's done. And so uh, we have all these unnatural partners. So health professionals and law enforcement officers have much in common. We don't. You know, we, we don't have the same mission. We don't have the same language. But if you come to San Antonio and you see that we've got to trust each other, we've learned what each, other, what each other's needs are and how we can assist each other, so uh, I've got a lot of different videos. Lots of people have come and done, you know, their videos and films. But I'm just going to show this one. It is called Roll Call, and uh, these are unnatural partners. And uh, you'll be amazed at uh, what you're about to hear. Service quickly. The Restoration Center did not take violent individuals. 
we don't have seclusion or response. The restoration center did not take you to The person is seriously injured or suspected of an overdose, you should go to the nearest emergency room. Honestly, if the person is that seriously injured, EMS needs to transport them to the ER. Just remember, the rumor about falling ahead is not true. But if you do have questions, call this number. If you're not familiar with the location, 601 North Rio is downtown less than a mile from the man. The entrance is long, paving for a little way. This is where you park. Whether you have an injured prisoner, an emergency detention, or an inebriate, they'll take them off your hands quickly and get you back on the streets as soon as possible. EDs, 15 minutes or less. Inebriates, no wait time. Just drop them off. The place to sit down and write your report. Injured prisoner, not like long waiting time for emergency. 24 hours a day. Seven days a week. 365 days a year. At the Restoration Center, law enforcement is your primary customer. The Restoration Center thanks you for your service.
big uh, outpatient clinic downtown. It used to be the county hospital with Brady Green. But they also had an urgent care clinic there that they operated during the week, during the day, and a half day on Saturdays that did x-ray and lab work. And so the hospital administrator agreed to let me have a suite of beds there. So we moved our whole crisis unit, and all of a sudden we could do medical clearance and psycho valves in the same place. And all of a sudden, you know, the diversions from jail and research went up, and the number of people, uh, uh, I mean, went up uh, to our crisis center, the number of people going to jail and research went down. And uh, so I had to find a way to pay for that medical service after hours and half down Saturday and all day on Sunday, and it was very expensive for the for the number of uh, people that we were doing medical clearance. So being partners with law enforcement, when we talk when you talk about that natural partner, we work together. What I found out was a lot of law enforcement officers uh, arrest people that have no mental illness, no substance use problems, but they have some kind of minor med medical emergency like there's abrasions or a small cut or a complaint of wrist, wrist pain or, or whatever. And so they end up going to the emergency rooms to get that problem uh, set and handled. Then they get triaged to the back of the line because they haven't been in a car wreck or had a right back. And so they're there a long time. So now they can just bring them to us. We'll sum them up, get a tennis shot, and you're right back on the street. You take them to jail or wherever you're going to do. Like, we do value added stuff. So that's why I'm kind of talking about making sure that all the public dollars are spent in the best way, you know, supporting, uh, you know, the community in the best way we can. So we keep a lot of data on cost and outcomes. And because of that, you know, the county knows how much it would cost them to build another thousand beds in the county jail. You know, so we're willing to help fund this, this crisis. The city, so let, let me tell you this story real quick. I'm going to run out of time. Uh, so, uh, we knew that one of the biggest problems in the community was really alcohol and drugs, and Texas just didn't fund alcohol and drug treatment. And we've, so we put that on the parking lot and decided sometime we're going to find a way to fund it. So we did. <coughs> and so what used to happen with the, the public and who many times have co occurring mental health disorders, uh, the downtown San Antonio were you know, a convention city or a tourist site. So we have a lot of homeless people who are aggressively panhandling. And as you know, people who are panhandling aren't using that money for food. They're using it for alcohol and drugs. They go to the, the community shelter for the food and other stuff. You know. And so uh, what happens in San Antonio, these people got arrested all the time for aggressively panhandling, for uh, petty thefts, for uh, being passed out in the street, for criminal trespassing, so when somebody's forced to for urinating or definitely in public, you name it. And this is the United States, you've got to arrest them. You've got to go before a judge, right? You know, you just can't be incarcerated without due process. So you go for the, the magistrate, the administration process, they give you a little uh, fine for whatever little nasty deeds you got picked up for, get thrown in the drunk tank, and they start monitoring you, and just as soon as you, you, you get to the point where they think you're going to go into convulsions or DTs, they let you go. Because they've already paid some of those million dollar lawsuits with people that, you know, dying there. So they let, let you go, you go right back out on the street and start self medicating. Now, I don't know if you all know this, but most people who are homeless or most uh, addicts or, or alcoholics, they don't drink to get high anymore. You know, they're miserable people. They, they drink and drug to keep from getting sick. You know, their bodies, you know, turn on without, you know, these, these medications. So they're, you know, it, you know, they don't drink a drug. I mean, you can see them, you know, you know, laying on the street. You know, they're not, they're, they're miserable. You know, so, you know, this, this notion of, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, and, you know, some people can do that, but most people can't. So, uh, we opened up this sobering And I don't know how much uh, San Antonio has spent on magistration process, but I know that the court system is spending $16 million a year. And most of that, uh, or a lot of that, was uh, these public. Uh, the cost of the drug tank, the fact that these people don't have any insurance or eyes impaired, they can never make a good decision for themselves. And so they were, you know, doomed to a life of, of addiction and early death and, and being a problem for you and I. So now the cops don't take them to magistration anymore. They have to make a major crime. They bring them to our sewer. Well, we used to have beds, 
People were so inebriated, sick, they were falling off the beds, hurting themselves, so they don't have mats on the floor. Almost, and we did a social detox with medical supervision, so it cost a lot less than Malibu, whatever, where you go ride your horses and swim or swim. <laughs> it's very cost effective, but almost everybody that works there is in recovery themselves. So we're, when people walk in the door, we're calling them sir, we're a man, we're treating them with dignity and respect, we're giving them showers, we're giving them clean clothes, and our staff are on their hands and knees saying, hey, I used to be sick like you. On the other side of that wall is a detox center, don't you want to let us, you know, don't you want to let us help you? So about 20% of these people, that's one reason that the homes counts downtown, it's down 85%. About 20% of these people a month choose to go to detox. Well, you and I know that detox is necessary in medical intervention that doesn't work too well, right? Now, you've got Lindsay Lohan in this study. <laughs> how, many, how many concerts have you been through detox? Yeah, a lot of our family and friends. You know, very expensive that, you know, people relapse over and over and over again. What's important is how you maintain your sobriety after the detox. So right across the street from the Restoration Center is this homeless shelter called the Hope Haven for Hope. Google it. It's an incredible shelter. Uh, I run all the therapeutic services there, and also I run the safe sleeping area, where six or seven hundred people a night sleep. Almost all of them have mental illness and addiction problems, or they're sex offenders. And you're not going on the make house that even for hope, because the average age is 12 years old, old there. But the sex offenders, we've got most of them work in, they're not in parks or other places where they might be tempted or, or the public might be at risk. So, uh, anyway, uh, we have two dorms on the homeless campus. And the homeless campus is out on drug free. If you go on the main campus, you have to sign a pledge that says you'll be out on drug free and you'll work eight hours a day. Well, I know some students are put through nursing school, or, you know, in the welding school, culinary arts, or whatever. But it's productive. It's not like a lot of shelters. I mean, you have productive things there, and they've moved a ton of people into regular jobs and community, very regular housing. So I think it's a good one, they were probably it's pretty incredible place. So uh, we have two dorms there called in-house recovery, one for males and one for females. It's sober living. And there are 90 plus day programs. And so you're not tempted, you're not back in your own environment, there are no alcohol and drugs there. And everybody in that program, the staff, are all in recovery. So you're there long enough, to, just because just you go through detox doesn't mean your brain chemistry is working right. You know, if you've been drinking lots of alcohol, you can be consuming, you know, thousands of calories every day. If you put you on a healthy diet, you might feel like you're starving and you want to run. So, you know, we jack the calories up to begin with and we get you on a healthy diet later. But you're there long enough and when your brain starts ticking in, you start being a human being again, you're being rational. You figure out, what have you done to your children? What have you done to your family? What have you done to your friends and yourself? And you start learning about your disease. You start learning how to manage your disease. We start hooking you up with, you know, your, your faith community or AA or NA or whatever kind of supports you need when you get out. We start working on jobs in, in independent housing. So, you know, 60 to 70 percent of these people that go through this program a year later are still clean and sober. Most working and living independent. You know, the costs of about like that our outcomes are really good. So. Everything doesn't have to be expensive, but you have to think through this and do the continuum of care to make sure you're doing things smart and everybody working together. So, you know, my message is don't do what we do here in San Antonio. You know, I've already heard about all the great programs that you have here. You know, your, your Better Wealth uh, Women's, you know, program and the collaboration that goes on there. You've got a lot of service, great services here. And uh, I've done this for a lot of people, so, uh, you know, I think your, your editor is going to talk to people in Des Moines, Iowa, Iowa and uh, 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 Wyandotte County and Johnson County, <coughs> Kansas City Suburbs. We're doing something similar. But what's really, really important here is that you all work together and use your existing resources. I know you're already working on no, uh, no wrong work concept, but how you link those services together and make sure that the, the people that you know, need the services the most. So I get some criticism. Because we're poorly funded, we're not reaching out to what what some people call the worried about. Okay, and, and since we have limited dollars, I run the, the public uh, mental health system. You know, and I have limited dollars, I have to make some decisions. 
And so I had a board member all over me about, you know, you know, you know we're spending all this money on these roads, like people watching, you know, what some of these other folks have problems too. And what I, what I said to the board was, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, coming up on a ship, shipwreck and there are three people in the water and two people in tread and the third person is going down for, you know, for the last time. Who are you going to throw that life on? And so that's why we started. We started using our limited dollars and resources, really, you know, for the most vulnerable and the most at risk. And because of that, we've been able to expand to other groups because we've got all this credibility uh, uh, about being good stewards of public dollars and actually having good outcomes. So uh, I could talk all day. Uh, we did the same thing with children. So I had a children's crisis unit. Uh, uh, Summer of this, we developed one of the first curriculums in the United States for school police. Uh, school police, a lot of times, it's entry level jobs because it's 10 month jobs, and you get young people coming out of the academy who are taught to use a command voice, command presence. Uh, some teachers calling, and some kids really been acting out. And you can hear the teacher's voice, you know, I want you to come and get this kid. And, and the message underlying is, I never want to see him again. And because they're playing, you know. Disrupting the class and are you know, doing you know, rude and, and uh, you know, inappropriate things. So we train these officers to recognize emotional disturbances and mental health. So you don't have this young officer going out to the young person who's emotionally disturbed or mentally ill, who's full of hormones, getting in front and the face you from your command voice, command presence. These officers are taught to recognize these symptoms. They step back. They use de-escalation techniques. They calm the kid down. They call us, they call the family, we get to get in treatment, then go to the detention center, then get kicked out of school. Both things put the kid on the wrong track. And so, uh, you know, there's just so much you can do as a community if you just think through these things well. And, uh, and uh, so uh, I bet you a lot of your leadership and your women's organization, uh, you know, the people in this audience, uh, you, know, uh, you know, our real secret, if I have any secret, is our communities come together to work on these problems. We have a continuous quality improvement environment. And uh, if it doesn't work, we change it, we do something else. But uh, and we keep a lot of that in the environment. So uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, talk to you today. And uh, I know that you guys don't believe this is too good to be true. So I do this all over the United States, and every time I get people come to visit, because they gotta come see for themselves, they just don't believe that you know, you know, this guy is Blog smoke, you know, tell us a bunch of things like this is too good to be true, can be true. So come visit. <laughs>
you want to raise your hand and pass it towards one of these middle aisles. And Alita's coming down this aisle, and Annie's coming down that aisle. So don't be shy. Go ahead and pass those down. Uh, and they will be collecting the first round of cards. And I'd also like to ask Silas, could you come back? And also Anne, if you're around. And could you just have a seat here? We've asked Silas and Anne to help us in a minute to kind of sift through these cards and get a sense of people's initial answers to this question. So don't be shy, see some collected. So maybe uh, Annie and Lita, you can pop those up onto them, um, over to their table. To get the ball rolling on this conversation, we've asked one community member to share a response. Uh, while all of you are kind of processing the stories that you just heard uh, and are writing down your cards. And after that, we'll hear from all of you. So we've asked uh, Susan Wilson, you probably know her as the Executive Director of Youth Violence Prevention Council, she's also a Women's Fund member. We've given her kind of an impossible task. Uh, we asked her to take part in a, it was kind of an impossible, right? uh, to take part in a, a meeting with a small group uh, together with Mr. Evans earlier today, uh, a group of people whose work touches on mental health one way or another. And we've asked her to do an all live synthesis, like we've given her the back of an envelope uh, to synthesize that conversation <laughs> and to share a few highlights uh, with all of us, some insights about what may be applicable to the local area, and to do that in no time flat. Uh, so while you are all writing down your cards and, you know, give a wave if you need another card, uh, we'd like to welcome Susan to share some initial thoughts. Law enforcement there, I saw Scott Fredrickson in the audience, I've seen Rob Colletti, 
Mike Johnson, the Chiefs from Reading and Anderson. Um, medically, lots of people from the medical organizations this morning. We saw Dean Germano, John Chula, and Dora, and I've seen many more of you this afternoon. And then um, a special call out to the Reading Rancheria. This morning, Glenn Hayward was there, and thanks to him, and I've seen other members of the Rancheria here this afternoon. And then also a special thanks and a call out to First Five Shasta that was there this morning, Joy Garcia. So we have partners, we have funding partners, we have community partners. What we have to do is figure out how to put them together and collaborate and make that work. Then the third piece I want to talk about that came from Leon was what I'll call continuous quality assessment. And I was putting in mind of a line that Arthur Conan Doyle wrote for Sherlock Holmes. It gives you a little insight into my personality, you know that. Um, and that line is, data, data, data. I can't make bricks without clay, okay? We cannot break, make bricks without clay. Lots of us have data. Public health has lots of data. Mental health has lots of data. The substance use disorder treatment groups have lots of data. Schools have lots of data. The public defender's office has lots of data. data. You know, we have, we have data. The problem for us is that we don't necessarily effectively share that data. And the bigger problem is that data is almost not shareable. You know, we collect our data in our own little silos, and sometimes we find ourselves in the awkward predicament of sharing apples with oranges. So one of the lessons I think to take away from this is that we need to come up with some shared measurement tools, some ways that we can measure across the, um, across the various agencies to do it. Another issue, and I think the people from mental health will give me a little nod on this, is how do we release that data? Some of this data is very confidential data. So how do we get data and use data Particularly when we're talking about something like substance use disorder, people with substance use disorder, people with mental health disorders, people who are homeless, how do we share that data in a good way, in a realistic way, in a way that preserves the confidentiality and privacy of those individuals? One of the things that um, Leon said this morning that, that really resounds with me is that he said one of the first things we had to do was learn to treat everyone everyone with respect and dignity. Everyone. We needed to speak to everyone respectfully. So I think that that's a lesson for us to take home. So how do we build a data set? I'm not sure. I'm looking for answers. I'm looking around this room. There are a lot of you who know answers. We even have Brian Dolly with us today, and maybe he even knows some answers. You know, I mean, how, how, how is our community? How is our community? And how are we going to make our community better? And we're looking to you to answer our A number one question there. Knowing that each community is different, what about the San Antonio model actually could be applied here? What do you think is one of the most important things or some of the important things that we need to touch on? I told you my three biggies, you know, and, and I, I think that um, many of you have some thoughts as well. One of the reasons we went to the card system today, which is a little bit difficult for you, is that we couldn't figure out how to get people through a microphone, you know, wandering up and down the aisles and so on. So thank you for living with our, our um, effort here. I think that, um, oh, I think that we have our first questions, <laughs> our first comments. Okay, these are individual comments. So one of the things that we're going to do is go through as many of these individual comments as we can so that you all can um, hear what people have to say. This, this person says, all of the model could be applied here if we all work together. That goes back to the collaborative that I was talking about. We need to act collectively. Okay. We need to act collectively to make this happen. It's our community, and we control its destiny. Hooray! Hooray for that person. Next, oh, it's always fun to read these things. 
law enforcement, and medical, medical, social services, community, etc., all need to work together. This includes reevaluating agency budgets. And you know, money money does help drive some of these efforts. Um, I, I'd like to say that it's the passion of the good people in the community that makes it work, but it's not always just the passion that makes it work. We, we also need to sort of put our money where our mouth is as a community. So I like that comment particularly. This comment, city and county rehabilitation options post detox. Um, we, so this person is talking about substance use disorder treatment and saying that we need to create a continuum of care not so disjointed with duplicated services. So we know that we do have services for people with substance use disorders and for people with mental health disorders, but again, they're siloed services. Um, I would say, I would make one comment about um, this, this particular comment, and that is, I, I have to say that the Empire Right Roads, the county, Visions of the Cross, Good News Rescue Mission, we all know what each other does. And we try and, and develop an effective system around it. But nothing is perfect, and it can, it can get better. Uh, another comment from this person, create a place for each type of group, single mothers, families, sex offenders, mental health, substance use. So yes, I mean, that's, that's a, a, great, a great thought. Um, I, I would point out to you that we don't want those places necessarily to be separate because there are single mothers who have mental health and substance use disorders. There are families with the same issues. So we need to look at each, each um, I think I go back a step, I think we need to look at each person individually and do what needs to be done for that person. Finally, this person said, restoration place, exclamation point, speed officer release, and she goes on for a key he or she goes on through some of those thoughts. This comment, treatment works. We need interagency collaboration. Maybe we need to look at unnatural partners working together. Um, that's a kind of an interesting way to put it. But it's true, sometimes you have to not go to the, I always call it usual suspects. Sometimes I think you have to move past the usual suspects and not say, oh, if we're going to talk about substance use disorder treatment, Therefore, we will call the Empire, we will call Right Road, we will call Visions of the Cross, and we will call um, the Mission. Maybe we need to start looking at, looking at some other things. So, um, this person said that there are other places out there that need to be part of the, the party, and I would agree. This one um, says we need a better sharing of resources, um, less of the that's not my job mentality, and it, that goes to a lot of what we've said. Collaboration here, unrelated. Okay. So I think that we're going to collect all these and sort of rank them up, and so you don't have to take notes or feel, feel that you need to know absolutely everything. Um, this one starts with, of course, my very favorite for those of you who know me: treat people like people, dignity, respect, always. Uh, talks about uh, trauma-informed care and trauma-informed child protective services. Talks about intensive case management and wraparound services. And this morning, um, I didn't hear all of Leon's uh, presentation to you, but this morning he talked quite a bit about wraparound services that look a lot like what Mental Health Services Act is doing for a very small but significant population of our clients. And then, um, this person goes on to say, in very tiny writing, um, a mental health collaborative focus not on what we can't do, what won't work, and criticizing what is and isn't being done, but on what we can do by working together. And um, talks about additional funding for substance abuse treatment. So those of you um, who have been in Reading for longer than 10 years, Longer than 10 years, oh, I love this audience. Longer than 10 years. You remember um, uh, about that time 10 years ago, we actually closed our, um, our psychiatric hospital locally. We closed the PUF, the, the psychiatric hospital facility. Do you remember that? Yes. And that was actually a decision that was put together by a, by a group in the community, um, community members.
members and agency members, city, county, everybody who worked on that particular problem, you know, we can, we can convene those things and try again. Um, this person says, police here seem to have no training in de-escalation. If they do it, it is not apparent. If they do, it is not apparent. For many um, encounters and, and in violence or death. So I will say that in the past, and I've been part of this effort, so I know that it exists, we had a, 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 a a group, um, and I think it was headed up by NAMI, um, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, um, where we did what we call CIT, Crisis Intervention Training for Law Enforcement, that would include people in the jail, etc. Uh, officers on the street, officers in cars, officers on bicycles. And that, that effort has, has slacked off a little bit, but we talked about it this morning, and Leon, that was one of the big things that he said, change their neighborhood change their neighborhood when the police and law enforcement have training. So I think that's an excellent thought. Um, this person says a sobering center similar to that in San Antonio is needed with a county detox as the next step for the willing client and outpatient, inpatient treatment, and so on, so that quality is assured. I would agree. Um, this person mentions a ready day resource center could serve as a recovery center. So I think that might be a reference to the AB 109 Day Resource Center. I don't know who wrote that, but that might be what that comment is about. You'll never guess what all these are about. Money. Yeah. <laughs> they all say funding on top. It was a trick question, you know. So um, when we talk about funding, and we always have to talk about money, and um, one of the other comments I would make is that I, I think that we are not the only community problems that we see that we have. Obviously San Antonio had them and made some steps. The one thing I do want to say right now though is that every community I think needs to look at it differently because there's a different, not different solution, but different solutions with an S for every community. You know, we need to build our own collaboratives and our own way of doing it that works in our neck of the woods. We're not San Antonio, we don't have a million people. And um, at one point, I they had received a grant of $82 million to help them in their effort. $82 million would go a long way, would you agree? Mm -hmm. So funding. How do we educate community members about the cost effectiveness of providing treatment instead of punishing people who need treatment? Funding. Where do we, where do we in Reading in Chester County get funding to treat house the mentally ill without creating um, tox increases. County supervisors will not approve an expansion of the existing facilities to accommodate more mentally ill inmates. You know, um, I think one of the things that we heard from Leon is their effort to keep mentally ill people out of the jail, not in the jail. So even though um, we know that our jails are full and we know that there's a lot of turnover going on. I think that one thing that we heard from him was try another way, you know, see if there's another way to do that. Um, funding, how do we get all of the agencies and organizations to share funding? I would say that that's a tricky, tricky one. Um, <laughs> you know, um, the way that money flows, you know, I, I could use the, the Youth Violence Prevention Council. We get some money through the courts. We get some money through probation. We use a tremendous number of volunteers. You know, thanks go to the Public Defender's Office and the District Attorney's Office because they train our kids to be attorneys in the Youth Peer Court. Um, everybody has different needs and gets their funding on different paths. I think that what we have to start doing is thinking collectively about things like um, education and training, because education and training are sustainability issues. So let's take Triple P. Public Health and Children's Services, the county of Shasta really, um, took on a Triple P. Okay, I think it was funded with MHSA money, if I remember correctly, that would be Mental Health Services Act money. And we spent close to a million dollars and trained 
hundreds of people to do this, this curriculum we call Triple P. And what is Triple P? It's a positive parenting program. And what we were after is trying to give parents who are often challenged by the fact that they have children. I was one of those parents. I remember getting home from the hospital and going, wow, they didn't tell me I had to bring them home, you know. <laughs> um, working with parents specifically to help them um, have a better toolkit to work with their kids. So that kind of investment in the community goes a long way. So I, I don't know everybody in this audience, but how many of you have used, heard of, participate in an agency that has something to do with Triple P? Would you raise your hands? Look at all those hands of those people. So obviously, that kind of thing can change our community. So I, I, I mean, that's one easy way to share funding. Um, this funding question, when I started working in mental health, we used to have more collaboration. Unfortunately, I've seen this reduced since dollars have decreased. This community should include private clinicians into the care systems versus limiting pay resources, increased funding for clinicians, etc. So, you know, the way that money flows is, is very, very important. Then this final funding question, actually there may be more, you never know, but um, where did San Antonio get the money for the restoration center with all those beds and medical staff available, and how would Reading get that money? And this morning when Leon was talking, I told you about his $82 um, successful um, bid, but he also talked about um, cost-benefit analysis and talking about he, he could prove to law enforcement, I think it was law enforcement who was talking about, that he could save them money. I think he talked about $16 million he saved in law enforcement in San Antonio and the hospitals, those two. $16 million he saved them by keeping the high utilizers of the systems out of the systems. So we know that there are some people who have many needs, they're picked up by the police, they're taken to the emergency departments in the hospital, those are what we call our very expensive clients. And they found that by treating and diverting those clients, they could save $16 million, which then, instead of going into the coffers of the agencies, actually was partially used to run the restoration um, center. I hope that helps answer that question. And then uh, city-county collaboration, cheaper alternatives to jail with a treatment emphasis, um, C2I processes, um, and that gets fairly down in the, <coughs> fairly detailed, so I think I'll skip that question. Oh, we have a final funding question. How do we help families who are working but do not have resources for services? Um, we need more resources than Shasta Community Health Center or mental health. We need more open doors of funding for them um, that's not just, that, that isn't threatening to them. And helping younger kids in schools before they get into trouble. And that's why education is so important to us, I think, as, as part of this whole effort. I mean, I'm, I'm a person who really believes in prevention, so my thought is, you know, we need to help the parents of today work with the kids of today so they don't turn into those same parents of tomorrow that they, they stand a better chance. Because you may not know, but some of the statistics that are out right now say somewhere between 50 to 60% of the children born in poverty today, and it's a lot of children. Let me tell you, it's a quarter of our children are born into poverty. 50 to 60% of those children will stay in poverty their entire lives. That means they will produce offspring that live in poverty. So this is not a, we, we, we need to change this trajectory. Here's a personal story. I'm presuming it's okay to read this personal story. I think it would make a big difference to bring the mall here. I, I hear constantly about transients and how people want them off the streets of Reading. But where are they to go? It makes a lot more sense to bring a model like this here. Having a son who just spent two years in prison for doing a lot of wrong things to get drugs. He has been out barely two months and has just gone back to drugs within two weeks of being home. He goes to probation almost every day. 
tells them he is under the influence, and they tell him, quote, we are not here to get you into trouble, we are here to help you, unquote. I see no help. Bringing, into the San Antonio, bringing in the San Antonio model would help him and others. I do believe he needs counseling. It was, a, it was great to hear that Mr. what Mr. Evans said about options. Either get help or go to jail. Exactly how I feel. So thank you to that person who was willing to share their story. Let's give that person a round of applause. Okay. These are all about asking the right questions. Are we tracking how many families are homeless due to children's mental health? Are we? I don't know. These families worry about CFS and agencies' interventions and using their child or children due to an ill child. What funding do they have more access to? Private clinicians? How do we get them more access to private cl clinicians and other services? So again, you know, how, how do we, how do we collect our data? You know, that's one of the big questions. How do we collect the data? How do we know who falls into what, what piece of, of the puzzle? So when we talk about data, we actually talk about two things. I want to remind you, you know, there are, there are what I call the statistics, the stats. Those are the numbers that many organizations collect in order to get their funding. And then, just like this that I just read you, there are the stories. And it's the stories that give the stats some meaning. So whenever we talk about data, we do want to talk about both the stats and the stories. Would you all agree with that? We need to know the stories. So that's that one. Let's see. Treatment works. But what has caused the seeming increase of homeless, transient, mental illness, suffering in our society that wasn't as visible 10 to 20 years ago. How do we prevent rather than treat that, um, that disorder? So that's one of the questions that someone thinks that we need to address. And I would agree. I would also say that recently when I glanced at some of the homeless statistics, there aren't that many increased numbers. I think one of the things that we face is that we're just a little bit more aware of the issue now than we used to be. I think those people were here. I think they weren't as obvious necessarily to us. I think that we weren't trying to address the problem. That would be some of my personal thoughts. Uh, another um, piece of data that somebody gave me recently was that they said, surprisingly, a lot of these are homegrown folks. These are not people who stopped off after hitchhiking up I-5. These are people that were born and raised here. So did the economic chain turnabout have some, some effect on this? I think so. You know, people lost their jobs. When you lose your job, you can lose your house. When you lose your house, things start falling apart really fast. So maybe that had some effect. But that's certainly a question that we can work on. Next comment, we have National University and Simpson University that have counseling, psychology, master's degree programs. Why not have this, why not have supervisors to do supervision for interns for the homeless? And I do believe there might be some programs like that. Homelessness doesn't happen to be my particular um, area of specialty, but you know, somehow releasing, not releasing, decreasing the cost of treatment can be an important piece. I think that um, right now, many of us look to government to provide the, the money for, the, for treatment for folks. And um, I think that that might be a piece that we need to rethink. So thank you for that question. Another question, another comment, it looks, it took two years for the, oh, for the building of the One Safe Place. So One Safe Place, I, I, Jean King was in our audience this morning, don't know if she's here tonight, but I think they had an open house last night, and I think they're ready to go. Yay, Jean. Yay, Francie. <laughs> funding from several different places. 
but and a lot of it was local funding to build something that they knew that we needed that could be good, clean, healthy, safe. So yay for that. I, I saw that they were having a party as I pulled into Reading last night. So I had a headache. I didn't go. Um, we have a non-medical social model detox in Reading, underfunded. We want to collaborate with other resources. How can we organize that collaboration? So I think, again, um, collaboration and knowing what each other does is really important. I think the county has reached out to, especially to substance use disorder treatment facilities, and that's the correct name for it this day. Just, just if, if you want to remember it, SUDS, S-U-D-S, Substance Use Disorder Treatment. Okay, SUDS, treatment. And I, we, we meet regularly, every month or two or three, all of us, and talk about what are we going to do the same, how are we going to do things differently, what do we need that we don't have instead of a hospital emergency room or jail. We do have a crisis center here. Um, I don't know how much it's used. I don't have the data. Data. We need the data. I don't have the data on that, but we do need data. We're, we're there. I have to shut up now. <laughs>